let me ask a question. Is the law sin? Is the law sin? Sometimes we think it's sin. And certainly that was a question that Paul thought was going to be on the minds of his readers as he is laying out this gospel message. Laying out the detail of it. Building the case for why Christ did what he did and why death, burial, and resurrection was the only way. There is no other plan that man could come up with that could provide the salvation, the rescue, the deliverance that we needed. So Paul is building this case and he's showing the purpose of the law, how God used the law in that story. And a lot of his readers were going to be asking the question, so if, if grace abounded when sin abounded, are you saying, Paul, that we should just keep on sinning so that grace can abound even more? We get that question all the time. You grace teachers, are you just telling us to go out and sin all the time? Is that what you're telling us? When you say that Christ has taken away sin once and for all, and that all sins or behind the back of God, never to be seen again, that he remembers them no more. Paul, are you saying to us that in light of that truth, it doesn't matter what we do? And then, are you saying that since sin was stirred up by the commandments, that Through the commandments, sin produced all kinds of fruit of death. Paul, are you saying that the law is sin? And that's the question he poses for us today. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? We're in Romans 7 starting in verse 7. Is the law sin? Well, what I'm going to do right now is simply read through the rest of this chapter. So if you have your Bibles, just follow along. Romans 7, 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said you shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death, for sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me, and through the commandment put me to death. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin... It used what is good to bring about my death so that through the commandment sin might become utterly sinful. Now we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature or in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. 
Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it's sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my flesh a slave to the law of sin. Pretty interesting passage, isn't it? Has a lot of meat. Has a lot of information about us. About our human nature, what we're like. And it doesn't paint a very pretty picture. We like to think of ourselves as good, as basically good. But when we really get down to who we are in our flesh, there's no goodness there at all. And God wants us to see that. God wants us to know that. God wants us to experience that so that we can let go and turn to Him. That's the story of this particular passage and it starts with that question, is the law sin? What role does this law play in God's plan of rescue? For some... They make the conclusion that law is bad. But Paul is going to tell us, no, on the contrary, the law is good. It's holy and righteous and good. So is the law sin? Paul answers emphatically, certainly not. I mean, how could the law be sin? Whose hand did it come from? God's hand. Who penned it? On those tablets of stone, God himself did. It was authored by God. It was given by God to the people of Israel. It had a holy purpose for that nation. And guess what? It has a holy purpose for us spiritually. So the law is not sin. What does the law do? The law defines sin, as Paul said, He would not have known what sin was if the law had not said, do not covet. I mean, Paul was going along pretty well in life, wasn't he? I mean, he was rising to the top of his game as far as being a Pharisee. He was tagged as the future leader. The hope of Judaism was pinned to his coattails. He was the guy. People admired him. People were inspired by him. People wanted to emulate him. People looked to him for answers. Paul was it. Talked about that in Philippians when he boasted a little bit about his flesh. He said as far as legalistic righteousness was concerned, he was faultless. But then he read the law, and he got down to number 10 that said, do not covet. And something happened. Something happened with Paul. He saw what sin really was. He wouldn't have known that if the law hadn't been there. But when he saw the law saying you shall not covet, sin did something. Sin seized the opportunity afforded by the commandment and produced in Paul every kind of coveting. Have you been there? Yes. Yes, I have. 
And yes, you have. So the law defined sin for Paul. It's much like, as we've talked about many times, the x-ray machine, a CT scanner, uh, uh, any of the latest medical apparatuses that look inside of us and tell us what's wrong. You go to a physician, my mom had triple bypass surgery recently, that was one of my weekends away, uh, going to be with her. Uh, She went in and was not feeling too well, knew something was wrong, but she wasn't paying much attention to it. it. It really didn't have the weight that the real issue had in her mind. She thought it may just be indigestion or something like that. And as she went, uh, her regular internist said, well, we're going to do an EKG. And the EKG saw, uh, showed some abnormalities. And the internist said, you're going to a cardiologist today. We're not waiting. It's going to happen today. And so she went to see the cardiologist. The cardiologist ran some other tests. Uh, The test showed that there was something drastically wrong. And they said, tomorrow you're going to have this cardiac catheterization and we're going to find out exactly what it is. And by the way, you're not going home. This is so serious. You're not leaving this hospital. And so the next day, she goes in for her cardiac catheterization and they run the dye up. And as soon as they see what's going on, They didn't come and say, wheel her back to her room. They put her on the gurney and wheeled her right into surgery. And they brought their top guy in to perform this operation. Was that cardiac catheterization bad? Was it evil because it found something sinister in my mom's body? Absolutely not cardiac catheterization was good saved her life I mean it was so bad they said if she had gone home and attempted to go up a single flight of steps she might have just fallen over and died that's how blocked her arteries were you say was that thing that pointed it out that showed how bad her situation was, is that thing bad? No, that's good. That's what the law does. It shows just how bad sin really is in us. So the only conclusion that you can make about the law, which is the conclusion that Paul made, is that the law is holy, righteous, and good. It comes from God's hand. He's holy because so whatever he gives, whatever he provides is holy in itself. God is right. God is just. So whatever he gives, whatever he provides is right and just. It's good because God is good. Whatever comes from in his hands has goodness written all over it. There's no way that we can conclude that the law is sin. If we do, we're going down a wrong path. We're going down the wrong direction. Because if we say the law is sin, guess what else we're going to say is sin? The very salvation that God gives to us in the person of Christ. So if you say one thing that God gives is bad, you're going to say Everything God gives is bad. Is that where the world is today? Absolutely. Anything that has God's name written on it, anything that speaks to Jesus Christ in this world today, the world is trying to to cause us to see it as evil. We speak truth from the word of God. We call sin what sin is and what does the world say it's hate speech 
That's what the world says. And guess what they say about Jesus? The exact same thing. So if we call the law bad, we're going to call his rescue plan bad. So Paul in this statement here is is making the point, he's making it loud and clear, he's putting an exclamation point on this question, is the law sin? No. It's good. Why? Because it comes from God. What is bad? Sin. What was bad with my mom? A blockage in her arteries. Plaque had built up so no blood could flow into the heart. It's a bad situation. Her arteries were fine. It was just this substance called plaque that had spent years and years and years building this dam in her arteries. That's what was bad. What's bad as far as we're concerned? What's bad out there in this world? It's that three-letter word, sin. Sin is what's bad. The wages of sin is death. That's what we talked about last week. That's bad, isn't it? If mom had not been able to find out what was going on with her, that plaque would have caused death. Her physical death. So sin is the bad guy. And we need to realize that. I think we lose sight of the problem. We call the law the problem. The law is not the problem. (laughs) When Jeremiah gave the words of the new covenant and talked about the prophecy of this new covenant and that one day there was going to be a new covenant. Well, the writer of Hebrews took that and brought it and made that the centerpiece of his letter to the Jewish people. But the question comes, why the reason for a new covenant? I mean, there was this old covenant. There was this Mosaic Covenant. What was the problem with it? And it was never a problem with the covenant. The problem was with the people. And the reason the problem was with the people wasn't because God had made them wrong. It's because sin had creeped in. Sin had had become a part of their beings. Had taken up residence in their human nature. And their flesh had become sinful. And there's nothing good that can come out of sinful flesh. No matter how hard we try, sin always produces sinful actions. That's the very nature of sin. It's sinister. And the end result is death. The same is true with us. The problem is with us. It's in our flesh. And this sin is sinister. I mean, it's opportunistic. I mean, it plays on our weaknesses. It knows that there is no way on God's green earth that we can carry out the righteous requirements of the law. So when the law gets presented to us and we see what righteousness is, we see what justice is, we see what God is like to some degree, we try to live up to it. And sin takes advantage of that opportunity. As it said, sin seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment produced in Paul every kind of coveting. Has it worked that way in you? When the law was presented to you, did sin seize that opportunity? 
It happens, doesn't it? And the very thing we don't want to happen starts to happen inside of us. Men get trapped in pornography. And they say, I've got to stop. I've got to stop. Because that's not right. And so they try. And they're doing it with human strength. They're trying to clean up the flesh. They're trying to get the flesh to respond differently. They're trying to get the flesh to become so anti-pornography, so resistant to it, that they could just walk in and it not affect them at all. Doesn't work, does it? But the more they try, the more sin seizes the opportunity and stirs up the desires. That's when people come to us for counsel who are trapped that way, trapped with some sexual sin, whether it's pornography, whether it's you name it. They have such a difficult time breaking out, breaking free from the cycle. Why? Because they're doing it through law. They're trying to do it in their own strength with human effort. And all sin does is seize that opportunity and produces in them every kind of sexual desire imaginable. And the trap tightens and tightens. what sin's like. That's what sin does. Sin sinister. It produces evil desires. That's sin's job. It produces evil desires. You know them, don't you? Right? Go ahead, shake your head. <laughs> no. <laughs> Ron, no. So it produces evil desires, and then the end result is sin brings death. Death happens on various levels. This body's going to die. That's the result of sin, isn't it? Everybody's going to die, unless the Lord comes back first. And then something's going to happen with these bodies. These bodies are still subject to sin and death. And when the Lord comes back, and if we're still here, something's going to change with us. The mortal is going to put on immortality. The perishable is going to put on imperishable. We're going to get new spiritual bodies that are no longer subject to sin and death. We're going to get bodies like the body Christ received upon resurrection. That's what we're going to get. But in the meantime, if we're here and Christ hasn't come back, these bodies are going to go into a grave. We know that to be true. There are other types of death. It's like the lady that is a little tired of her relationship at home, married with kids, and there's a guy that, you know, she works with. This guy's funny and This guy listens to her and this guy pays attention, actually looks at her in the eye, is interested. And she's not getting that at home. And she decides to take another step in this new guy's direction. They go out for coffee. It's just simple neutral, but it's not. Things are starting to well up in her that she hasn't felt in a long time. And she starts looking at this guy and comparing 
this guy with the slob that's at home. And the slob at home loses every single time. This guy's funny. This guy's not. This guy looks me in the eye. This guy mm -mm, is too interested in his stuff, his things, his, his life. This guy's actually in shape. This guy, not. And that list just gets longer and longer and longer. And, and the story of it says, I've got to dump this guy so I can get with this guy to be happy. Because I know I'm not happy over here. And pretty soon, death occurs. Death to a marriage. That at one time, the two parties believed God brought together. And at one time, the two parties stood before a pastor and a group of people and made a covenant one with another saying, we'll only separate upon death. You have death of a relationship. And if there's kids involved, there's death of trust and security and all of those things that are in those kids because of mom and dad. Death happens. That's the nature of sin. It's just what it does. Ever been in a relationship that you found out was based on nothing but lies? That you'd been lied to and manipulated? Guess what dies? Trust. That's what sin does. It's its nature. It's sinister. Do you realize it? Do you know that to be true? That's the way it is. So, what about the law? What's the goodness of the law? It's spiritual. The law has a spiritual purpose in all of our lives. It had a physical purpose for the people of Israel. It was their bill of rights. It was their governing document. It's what they always went back to when questions arose, when situations arose that they did not know how to handle. It was the law that answered those questions for them. Just like our Constitution today, we want politicians to hold up the value and the worth of the Constitution and to say that if problems arise today, we're going to let the Constitution answer it for us. That's why politics today is so complicated. Because we're moving further and further away from that reality. The Constitution is losing its influence and value in our country today. But for the people of Israel, their Constitution was the law. The Ten Commandments, 613 other laws, religious rituals that govern their way of life. But for us, the law has a spiritual purpose. It's spiritual in nature. And that spiritual purpose is to identify our problem. It helps us recognize sin. As Paul said, I would not have known sin if the law hadn't said that. It brings us to the end of ourselves. It brings us to that point where we say, Oh, wretched man that I am. Because that's what we are apart from Jesus. There's no goodness inside of us. There's no value that we can bring to the table as far as God is concerned. We learned earlier in Romans 3 that there is no one good. Yeah, we do some good things and we see some elements of goodness in this world because that's the way God is. 
But us left to ourselves, there's no goodness. Daughter Mackenzie's reading the book Lord of the Flies. Maybe you read that in your high school English class. It's an interesting look at humanity. Joseph Conrad's The Heart of Darkness, the same thing. Unbridled humanity leads to unbridled evil. Period. Why? Because of sin. When we recognize it, the law brings us to the end of that. So what is sin's trap? How does sin work? How does it try to ensnare us? Well, what we want to do, we don't do. Right? You've been there. It's a maze. I call this the Roman 7 maze. I mean, you get in and there's no way out of it. You turn this way and there's a roadblock and you turn this way and there's a roadblock and you turn this way there's a roadblock there's no way out of the Roman 7 maze just think of you know you're a scientist and you've created this little maze and you're going to see if the little test rat can get out of it but you know there's no way out but it keeps trying it keeps hitting its head against walls and turns and hits its head against another wall. And there's no way out. The only way out for that particular rat is if the scientist reaches down, grabs grabs the rat, and pulls it out. Guess what? That's our only way out. Jesus Christ reaches down into this Roman 7 met maze and grabs us and plucks us out and rescues us that's the plan there's no other way why because sin is too powerful sin is too good at what it does what we hate we do You're trapped in a sin, you hate it. You absolutely hate it. And yet you keep doing it. Man, at the end of a day, like God, here I am again. I've done it again. I tried. I tried. But I've done it again and I'm here and Lord, please forgive me, please. Do something. I'm going to work harder. I'm going to be better. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to go to church more. I'm going to do all of these things. And the next day, same time, same place, Lord, I did it again. Things we want to do, we don't. The things we don't want to do, we do. That's sin's trap. And no matter how hard we try, There's this law of sin in our bodies that keeps evil always present. Man, open up the Bible, read the Bible. Have an evil thought. Go to the Lord in prayer. You pray. Have an evil thought. That's just the law of sin in our bodies. Evil is always present. So what's the solution to all of this? Don't be deceived. Sin is the problem. Let's just put to rest today any idea that the law is the problem. Sin is the problem. Sin's the issue. That's what we need delivered from. That's what we need needed rescued from. When we understand that, we actually see the law in its proper perspective, that it is an instrument of grace in God's plan to save us. Have you ever thought of the law in those terms? That it is an instrument of grace in God's hands to bring about our salvation. 
just like that cardiac catheterization was an instrument in the hands of the physicians to bring about a healing of my mom's heart. That's good news, isn't it? That God loved us so much that He showed us the very nature of our problem. And He showed it to us in such a way that we can see the evil of sin. As Paul talked about, this sin became utterly sinful. Many of you have been in a family situation where one of your loved ones got a diagnosis of cancer. Before that time, since you have never, never been able to see it up close and personal, cancer was somewhat innocuous. You knew it was bad. You knew there were issues with it. But you didn't see it as utterly bad until your loved one. And you saw a body get decimated. And no matter what medications and what newfangled treatments were out there, the cancer kept doing its work. And it brought death. It's tragic. And now when you hear somebody else that's been diagnosed with cancer, you know how utterly awful that is. It's the way it is with sin. A lot of us just think of it as innocuous. A little lie. You know, a little this, a little coffee with the guy at the bank that is funny. One little look at a magazine, one website. It's no big deal. And then it traps you. And then you say, uh-oh, <laughs> that's sin. Has it become utterly sinful for you. That's why when we do something that causes pain in another person's life, we should weep that we who have been set free from the law of sin and death have been raised to walk in the newness of life, to have the love of God grip our hearts and flow through us into the lives of others. When we've been called to that life and yet we submit ourselves to the awfulness of sin again, to temptation that comes in our way, and we give in to it. And we see the harsh consequences in the lives of the people we love most. We should weep. Say, Lord, you didn't rescue me for that. You rescued me for something different. And I allowed myself to get entangled with sin again. My wife is hurting. She's in pain. Sorrow has come to her heart because of me. We've got to see it for what it is, people, so that we can live in the newness of life. Paul concluded, what a wretched man that I am. Why? He saw that sin lived in his flesh. Sin was the source of evil behavior and the only thing he could say is who will rescue me who will be the one I can't can't do it there's no plan that I can devise that will allow escape from sin's 
trap. There's nothing that I can do. There's no promise that I can make. There's nothing within me that can right the ship. Who will rescue us? It's the most victorious statement in the Word of God. Underline it. Circle it. Star it. Let this become your Hearts cry. When Paul said, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Who's going to rescue us? Who's going to snatch us out of sin's grip and set us free? Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he's done that through his death his burial, his resurrection. If you've turned to him by faith, you've been snatched out of sin's grip. You have been loosed. You know, want to know what binding and loosing is all about? This is it. We needed to be loosed from the power of sin and the grace of God is the only power that was strong enough to do it. And through resurrection life, Jesus Christ has come into us and has destroyed the power of sin and death and set us free so that we could live in resurrection life each and every day. Is that good news? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let it become your victory cry. And sin will lose its hold. I guarantee Well, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, let's help us to see the real problem. And Satan introduced it into the world. He deceived Adam and Eve. They had never given even a look, a glance at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They happily partook of the tree of life walked in union with you and fellowship with you, enjoyed your love each and every day. And then Satan pointed a finger to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They looked. And they were trapped. And sin, at that point, entered the world. so sinister and evil that it caused a separation. Adam and Eve were cast out. Angels were put at the entranceway so that they could not come back. But Lord, thank you that you knew about that and that you're more powerful than sin and death that you showed that power through Jesus, through his death that took away sin once and for all and through his resurrection that you conquered it once and for all. Help us in our lives to always lean upon you, rely upon you, trust in you because you and you alone or our victory. Help our hearts cry out each and every day, each and every moment. The victory cry, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We thank you for this possibility of experiencing freedom as you've designed it to be. We thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen.